so we'll first i think it's it would be a good starting point is to understand what is what is the environment in fact impact assessment notification you know india has had eias since 1994 um it's it's also a widely used tool in many countries um with you know it comes with the intention of trying to minimize the impact of large development projects um so so when we think of india and we think of a country that is still developing um and we have you know we have highways being constructed we have large dams we have hydroelectric power plants we have mines uh we have you know dredging for inland waterways we have a myriad of such large development projects taking place um and if such active activities were to go on without understanding the their impact on the environment or putting in some effort to try and minimize their impact on the environment um we would be in a much worse situation than we are today um you know and the the impacts of large development projects on the environment are large when we think of wildlife for instance um you know you, you have um fragmentation of forest habitats that causes um that that is detrimental to wildlife populations in, in the country um the pandemic that we're seeing today of course is also largely due to um environmental degradation so so what this instrument which is the eia does is essentially um it puts in place a process that any project proponent or some or a user agency or a person who wants to um you know initiate a large development project must go through uh where there are certain steps that are followed and i'll walk you through those steps um but through this process we look at what are the potential impacts of this large project um if i conduct if i construct an airport in the western ghats what are the potential impacts of this airport on this ecosystem um it's not only is it done from the standpoint of flora and fauna and um you know hydro hydrology and um seismicity etc it's also it takes into account a very very critical um stakeholder which is persons that are directly affected by the project and it gives them a voice and it allows them to express their opinion of this large development project uh and this is one of the highlights of the eia notification of 2006 um it also goes through studies to understand the socio economic feasibility of the project uh it sometimes prescribes conditions uh to ensure that land acquisition takes place in a fair manner in addition to the legal frameworks we have under the land acquisition act um and through this whole long process it comes to a determination as to whether this project should be allowed or not depending on the impact probable impact it is it is going to have on the environment so you know it it is at the end of the day a legal instrument that follows certain processes so i think to understand um what the changes in the 2020 draft are going to do it's first important to understand what is the existing process um and and also i'm really sorry but the devil is in the detail when it comes to comes to the law so i will try and be as as um you know i'll simplify this as best i can although i'm afraid i will have to go into some detail uh to lay out the process under the ei notification so it's basically it's split into four stages stage 1 is called the screening process and this notification has a list of projects um in a schedule at the end of the notification which says these are the types of projects that need a clearance they are categorized into three distinct categories there's category a projects which are usually very large projects that have significant uh, there are likely to have significant impacts on the environment and therefore it is the central ministry that scrutinizes and decides whether or not to grant clearance to such projects um so so you know for instance the construction of a large airport 
the construction of large lift irrigation schemes or hydroelectric power plants uh, fall within category A. Um, and there are, of course, you know, there's um, capacities provided in that schedule as to, you know, they, they provide certain thresholds and beyond a certain threshold, uh, a project is considered a category A project. These are usually scrutinized by a body called the Expert Appraisal Committee, which I will going forward refer to as the EAC. Um, and it is this committee that really gets into the nitty gritties of the project and either recommends or does not recommend a project for clearance. Category B projects are scrutinized by a state environment impact assessment authority, so the SIA. And the SIA, um, you know, these decides whether or not to grant clearances to, to category B1 and B2 projects. There is a dis distinction between categories B1 and B2 in that uh, B1 projects go through the whole process of environmental clearance, whereas B2 projects, for instance, are exempted from public hearings. As of date, there are about three, three categories of projects that are B2 projects as per the 2006 notification. The second stage is called scoping. And um, it is in this stage that the, the project proponent says, you know, I, I want to mine in Chhattisgarh and submits a form to the expert appraisal committee and says, hey, look, these are the details of the mine that I want, you know, that I that I that I intend to set up. This is the amount of forest land involved. This is the amount of you know revenue land involved. This is the amount of land we're going to acquire from farmers. Um, and this is the detail of the project. Um, when this initial form is scrutinized by the expert appra appraisal com com committee, it prescribes something called terms of reference. And these terms of reference are essentially broad pointers that the, the project proponent needs to keep in mind when it conducts its environment impact assessment studies. These terms of reference take into consideration uh, very site specific, you know, site specific details for where this project is proposed. So for instance, if, it, if this uh, project were to happen, say in the Western Ghats of Goa, uh, they would prescribe specific conditions as, as to looking at, um, you know, are there aquifers, are there, you know, uh, springs and aquifers that are gonna be impacted by this project? Or um, what is the loss in forest cover that is going to happen as a result of construction of this project, et cetera? And there are, and these, de these details are usually fairly uh, detailed and specific to the, the location and the type of project being envisaged. Once these terms of reference are prescribed by the expert appraisal committee, they are valid for a period of three years for most projects except hydroelectric projects for which they're valid for four years. It is in this three year period that the project prop proponent needs to engage an external accredited environment impact assessment consultant who goes and conducts all these studies as per the terms of reference and comes back with what we know as an environment impact assessment or an EIA report. Um, let's for a moment assume that these EIA studies are well done and, and try to understand, let's not go into a scrutiny at this point of how this process works today. Um, but we'll jump into that shortly. The third step is the public consultation or the public hearing. Um, now here, once the EIA report is submitted, the project proponent goes to the state pollution control board uh, and issues a notice for the public hearing. And public hearing is conducted um, in, in every project affected district. So if a project is affecting multiple districts, there are multiple public hearings held, held in every district. Um, or, I mean, these are the final details or there, there is a public hearing and everyone is invited to it. Um, now, as per the 2006 notification, there is a 30 day notice period uh, granted 
wherein uh, a copy of the draft environment impact assessment report is provided to people who are going to be affected by the project. They are given 30 days to critique it, understand it better. Uh, this EIA report is also, uh, what is called a summary EIA report, is also to be provided to them in the vernacular language in, in the place where this uh, project is proposed. Now, this public hearing is, is a, a very important and critical part of the EIA process because it is often comments from the public during the public hearing that really factor in for a litigation against a large development project. So it's a very, very important part of, uh, of the process. And um, it's also extremely transparent in that the whole public hearing is video recorded and minutes are taken down very, very diligently. And these are later submitted back to the expert appraisal committee or the EAC. Once the public hearing is done, the comments are considered and a final environment impact assessment report is prepared based on the comments, comments given by uh, the participants of the public hearing. The final stage is called appraisal, uh, wherein all this voluminous documentation is submitted to the expert appraisal committee, uh, you know, right from the EIA report, the terms of reference, the public hearing minutes, um, all of this is given to the EAC and the EAC may say, I'm unhappy with this study, so you can go back and study this further and come back to me. So it may defer a project or it may say, I can't recommend this project because the impacts of this project on the environment are too large and too hard to mitigate. So I can't, I'm sorry, but I'm not recommending, recommending this for um, clearance or they may recommend, clear, recommend the project for clearance. Um, as of date, uh, it may be of interest to note here that as of date, um, the rate of clearances is ridiculously high. Uh, there have been studies for um, grant of clearances for coal mining projects where the rate of clearance has been 99%. Um, so actually at this point, I'd like to pause and check if this was clear, if there are any questions, because going forward is a, is understanding what is changing in this process as per the 2020 notification. Um, so, so now, firstly, in this four-stage process, it now, has now been changed into a three-stage process where there is um, no screening. The screening has been deleted uh, because there is a clearer demarcation of what is a category B1 and a B2 project, and we'll jump into that in some time. So the first step now, as per the 2020 draft, is scoping. And um, this is, so some of the key changes in the scoping process is that EIAs typically were to be conducted over a year, you know, where one year's baseline data was to be collected from the study area. We are an immensely biodiverse country. country. We have lots of migrating species in the winter, in the summer. Therefore, it was, it was taking all this into consideration that EIAs were to be conducted over a year's time where people were actually sent to field, would collect data and come back with it and put it in a report. Um, the 2020 draft changes this to say, one season plus monsoon is when you will collect data. So we're basically ba basing this environment impact assessment report on inadequate or basically data that is, is not comprehensive or does not really showcase the biodiversity uh, of a study area. Um, so this is one of the, the primary, um, you know, areas that have been diluted in the 2020 draft. Um, additionally, the terms of reference, the whole idea of the terms of reference was that they would be site specific and project specific. But the 2020 draft emphasizes um, issue of standard terms of reference, which means that there is one template which will simply be printed out and handed over to a project proponent and they'll say, go study this. And there's no application of mind as to, you know, what are the potential impacts of this particular type of project in this particular landscape? So 
right at this stage at the very very at a very nascent stage of um of the ec process itself sees non application of mind on the part of the eac um and and so what we get we will get then in these eia reports is is not a true picture of of what should have been um in you know considered there is also an increase in the validity of uh, the terms of reference um so for instance for hydroelectric pro uh, projects it has been extended to 5 years and the reason why this is very similar and a lot of you would know if you are field people is that things change a lot um you know in in any given field site um the you know the there, there may be new species there may be um a change in the in the water use um rivers change their courses over over such a long period and so the whole idea of having a shorter validity for terms of reference was to ensure that it's done quickly before any drastic changes take place at this site of study uh, and this again has been diluted to extend the validity of the tor um eia reports are then prepared and the reason why having a comprehensive eia report is that again the eia report forms the bedrock of a challenge um of an environmental clearance in court and here is a case that i had worked on some years ago um and and we you know this is one of the grounds on which we challenge the clearance which is that they claim they had well i would like to say rediscovered the cheetah at this at the project site and uh, like we all know the cheetah went extinct in india in the 1940s i believe um and and so you know this is the quality of ei reports with a more you know despite having a more stringent ei regime diluting it further is only going to make the quality of these ei reports deteriorate even further um the next big concern is that public hearings um have been compromised as part of this process um as i'm sure you would at this point i think i can tell that um the public hearing is amongst the most important uh pro aspects of the ei process where people can actually raise their voice point out inconsistencies in the report um and and also express you know their opinion of a public uh, of this project in the, in their land um now the problem in the 2020 draft are are there are a few problems actually in the 2020 2020 draft the first is that it divests too much power in the hands of these committees which is the eac or the or the or the state environment impact uh, state expert appraisal committee um an example of this divestation of too much power is that the public hearing can be exempt if there is a local situation that does not allow for a public hearing to take place now the term local situation has not been defined anywhere it could mean are we scheduled the public hearing but it's raining it's a local situation we can't do a public hearing um or it could mean that there is too much opposition against this project and there is you know getting this minuted and having people openly express dissent is deeply problematic and so we could call that a local situation and get away with public hearing and please note that it allows for an exemption of the public hearing and not a postmo postponement of the public hearing so this is a clear i think a clear indication of um basically stifling the voice of people voices of people who are going to be directly affected by project so you know uh, to to it to illustrate it or give give a more to give an example it could mean that here in my house where i'm sitting down today is um, going to be the site for a mine and i should have a say in in you know whether i want this project or not what are my problems with it uh, that i want addressed and it is essentially taking away my voice uh and and this i think is one of the core issues with the 2020 draft the 2020 draft also exempts 
projects that are expanding with for less than 50% of their existing capacity from conducting a public hearing. Um, now, why this is important is all the more important in existing projects is that um, often these projects are not compliant with the conditions on which their, their clearance has been granted in the past. And then they go and apply for an expansion in the scope of their project. And it is at such a public hearing that it can be pointed out that this project proponent is already not compliant. Uh, and therefore, to grant permission for, for further expansion may be deeply problematic. And this, again, it takes away uh, the power of the people to go and point, point out problems with these projects. Um, and 50% is, is significant. Another reason why this 50% is, is of concern is because um, there, you will see a lot of expansion for up to 49.9% and therefore exempted from conducting a public hearing. Uh, a lot of you would notice, for instance, um, that when you go to a mall, there's often two blocks, you know, and the reason often is that each block will have a built up area of 19,999 square meters to escape the clutches of the EIA notification and so this these you know this playing around with numbers has been something that has been done in the past and we should only learn better from it uh, when we're looking to overhaul um, such a notification and it's it's very worrisome actually that um, you know there is a there is that 50 percent cap that is exempted from a public hearing um, it's also something that is already being exploited with coal mines because coal mines as of date, uh, when there is an expansion, an expansion of up to 40% of their existing capacity are exempted from public hearings. And this has resulted in a lot, in a lot of people's voices being stifled. And this can particularly be seen in states like Chhattisgarh and Orissa where mining is rampant. Um, finally, the time period for the comments on the, the EIA has been reduced from 30 days to 20 days. Um, and this is a great concern because these EIA reports are often extremely voluminous documents um, and, and it takes a lot of time to peruse them, run them past experts and understand whether they have been done well or if there are issues with the, with the EIA report, what are they, and then to raise them at a public hearing. And reducing this time period further from 30 to 20 days is, uh, is again, um, basically taking away, you know, people's right to raise their voice against uh, what is often a shoddily done EIA. With appraisal, again, um, we'll, we'll jump into category B2 projects in a bit, but um, the expert appraisal committee is now bound to grant what is called an prior environment permission within 50, 15 days of applying for um, a permission. And 15 days is, is in all likelihood an inadequate time period during which to, um, to understand what a project means, what are its impacts going to be, and then to grant a permission. So it, it, will, it is likely to result in non-application of mind by uh, the expert appraisal committee. Another concern with appraisal is that um, it takes away the power of the EAC to ask for fresh studies. In a lot of projects, it's been noted that um, the EAC is unhappy with the quality of an EIA or finds that there is a specific component of the project that needs to be studied better. And uh, this is you know, and then it prescribes this as an additional study, which the project prominent goes and conducts and comes back to the EAC. And the 2020 draft takes away this power of the EAC, where fresh studies can't be commissioned unless new facts come to light. And new facts in the, in the case of a large development project often means an expansion um, in the scope of the project. And it means a significant overhaul. Um, so this again takes away the power of the EAC in 
um, in trying to understand the impacts of the project better. And, and therefore, I think defeats the purpose of an EIA notification altogether. Um, the next one is changes in categorization, which has which is likely to result in a lot of projects getting commissioned um, and escaping the clutches of law um, and escaping having to, to undertake any mitigation measures um, for, for their projects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were about three projects that were in the B2 category, and now there are 29. And these projects range from construction of heliports, oil drilling exploration, um, lift irrigation schemes, hydroelectric uh, projects, etc. Um, and these projects don't require an environmental clearance. They require what is known as a prior environment permission. Um, this, this prior environment permission is, is, is very fairly simple, simple to obtain. They need to submit a document that says, here is my application. And um, you know the, the consultant, the EIA consultant will prepare an environment management plan. And this is taken to the appraisal authority, so the EAC. And it's granted within 15 days. Now, again, this is deeply problematic because we don't understand the impacts of the project. We are assuming certain things and preparing an environment management plan. EMPs often consist of inadequate measures, even when an EIA is done. So, for instance, you find that large mining projects um, have things like plant these many trees as an EMP. Um, and so not even understanding what a project mean, means and granting it uh, EMPs does not make sense. Um, this again, this also takes away from the very essence of an EIA notification where an EIA study is not even conducted. Um, and the types of projects that are being considered for a prior environment permission uh, are a cause for concern. Um, now, also modernization and expansion of projects is being, uh, you know, basically they will, they have the room to kind of go away scot free without conducting a fresh EIA or conducting a fresh EMP or basically getting or doing a public hearing and they get clearance without following due process. So, so this is this exemption actually is is again uh, quite worrisome and these slabs of up to 10% does not require ABC things. Or if, if you are you know, expanding your project to up to 50% of your existing capacity, you don't need a public hearing. Um, and, and again, that, that is, I mean, I'd mentioned this earlier, but this is again quite worrisome. Um, also at this juncture, we find that a lot of projects are in fact modernization and expansion projects especially when it comes to mines. And so this dilution specifically for expansion of projects um, is, it seems motivated and rather, um, well, for lack of a better word, it seems shady. Um, also important to note, I think that the EIA notification since 1994 requires that expansion or modernization needs a fresh clearance and has to go through all the four stages of the clearance process uh, to, to be permitted. Now, the, the, one of the larger concerns with the 2020 draft is the grant of ex post facto clearances. And ex post facto clearance essentially means um, that you do, do a certain activity illegally without the permits. Um, and then you're granted a clearance for it later. Um, now, again, it's really important to remember that this is not the first attempt at diluting the EIA notification. Um, it is perhaps the first attempt at diluting the EIA notification in a codified, upfront, in your face manner. Uh, but attempts at permitting ex post facto clearances have been um, 
made multiple times in the in the past and have been struck down by the ngt and the supreme court multiple times in fact there was an office memorandum passed by the moef in 2014 if i'm not mistaken um that allowed for grant of ex post facto clearances and was struck down vehemently uh by the the ngt as well as by the supreme court so um so this is not new the the mechanism for it is also quite um unwieldy wherein the expectation is that a project proponent submit a sumo application and basically admit that hey i am in violation here is my application uh, i'm so sorry i started mining without a clearance um and then a fine a meager fine is levied and they pay the amount and get away with it now um india has had a very protectionist approach towards towards the environment and our environment the, the environment of jurisprudence laid down over time has been that we we have forged the concept of for instance the precautionary principle which basically says that these are resources that are not you know once the damage is is done it's done it's hard to reverse um so and keeping that in mind we have the requirement for a prior environmental clearance if you open up the eia notification of 2006 it uses the word prior environmental clearance 36 times um so so um it's it's a bit you know at this point quite worrisome that pardon me just a second there's actually someone at my door um i just be back yeah um so so the um so you know allowing them for you know to come up on their own and say hey this this is you know i'm i'm in violation is problematic um also it allows for the project proponent to go ahead and submit an application for prior environmental clearance um and once this is done after they are in violation they may grant or reject a clearance so um it essentially legitimizes violations of the eia notification just to get a sense of the quantum of the fines um the, the fines are up to 5000 rupees a day for violation of a category a project and we all know that the budgets for these project run into several crore rupees um here is an illustration of the kalishwaram lift irrigation scheme uh, that that i i got to fight for a couple of years um well the budget for this project is rupees 1.25 lakh crores i don't know how many zeros are in that number but what is a 5000 rupees per day fine uh, when the budget for the for a project runs in so many lakh crore rupees um i just want to quickly touch upon some other issues um within the new draft um firstly non forested ecosystems will will see will really bear the brunt of this notification because this notification while it says um no construction without a clearance it also says at the same time that um you can level land no problem don't construct just don't level land oh uh, sorry don't just don't fell trees you can level land now a grassland ecosystem for in, instance you know there is no question of felling of trees or in a wetland there is no question of felling of trees but leveling such an ecosystem would basically you know seal its fate um there's there have also been changes in definitions of say the eco sensitive zone uh which has been quite sneaky in that you know the the supreme court has laid down that uh, the de facto eco sensitive zone for protected areas um that 
don't have a notified eco-sensitive zone is 10 kilometers. This has been changed. The very definition of this ESD has been changed to only include um, to, to only include notified eco-sensitive zones, which are just a handful. The study area in the prior notification used to be 10 kilometers off, you know, from the, the project site. This has been reduced to five kilometers and it makes no sense because these things cannot be, you know, they cannot be, there's no one size fits all when it comes to understanding the impacts of a project. And so these need to be done after giving it some thought understanding what this project means and then prescribing a study area. So neither the 10 kilometers nor the five kilometers is, it, it doesn't work, it doesn't really do the job. Um, this notification also sets up this whole new creature called the Technical Expert Committee. And this Technical Expert Committee has been given unbridled powers in that it, it can take decisions on changing the category of a project. Um, so, you know, like we're, today we talked about how there were three projects that were in the B2 category, it's now become 29. And this decision was made by the MOEF, but going forward, it's the technical expert committee that will make such decisions. We have no idea, there are no details as to what constitutes a te technical expert committee. What are the qualifications required for, for, for one to be a member of this committee, et cetera. Um, so these are, these, this again is, we'll have to see how this pans out, but clearly it's, it looks on the face of it, uh, like it can be used to further dilute uh, the EIA uh, notification. Finally, there is a, it has a defunct compliance mechanism in that, um, under the 2006 notification, um, a compliance report would have to be submitted to the EAC every six months. This has been changed to an annual compliance report. No site visits are required um, by officers of the MOEF. Um, and it is only if they are in, you know, in violation of compliance for three years and they've not submitted a compliance report for three years is their EC revoked. And three years is a long time to wreak havoc, um, you know, in, in any given area. Uh, and, and more so in, you know, in um, projects that are located in protected areas. We're all, we all see today what's happening in Bagjan and the, the Bruce Ekhova, um National Park. And it's a, it's a result of terrible compliance. Um, so I think as, you know, to end this, this, this bit, you know, what I, I think is important to note is that we are all protesting against so many projects. We hear that uh, the Bang is problematic. We hear about Vedanta. We hear about Dibru Saikova. We hear about Dehing Patkai. But if there is no strong EIA framework, any such opposition will, will fall on deaf ears because we are not protesting an illegal activity. Um, so to first make sure that we have strong policy um, is, is one of the best ways to ensure that, you know, the, the, the specific projects uh, are not in violation. So this brings me finally to how you can help. Um, and, and I think, so firstly, like I said, we need, there are many fights to fight and to prioritize these in terms of what is the most important one to address. Um, so in, in my head, I would think that um, ensuring strong policy and ensuring that, that, that environmental law is not diluted is a top priority. Um, perhaps going after individual projects is a lower priority than that. Uh, so I think a little thought into how should we priority, prioritize these things is very important. And also often um, environmental fights and legal environmental fights are fought on very, very limited resources. And so that makes prioritizing what we want to take up um, first all the more important. Um, 
this of course is not specific to the EIA, but I think that engaging about dilution of laws, en engaging about the dangers of a notification, talking about it, um, and understanding these things better, being more aware about it is very important. It's amazing to see the steam that the EIA notification of 2020 has gathered, but in all honesty, there has been a steady decline in the quality of environmental laws and, and there has been dilution of environmental laws since well 2014 and it has been fairly blatant uh, but it has never seen the kind of uh, revolt that we see today against the EI notification and I, I think it, it stems from a lack of awareness. Uh, every other week you will find that the MOEF has put up a new notification or a new office memorandum that further dilutes these laws. And so it is also done through delegated legislation and not necessarily through diluting the law itself. Um, so, so it's important to be aware of this. Um, of course, writing to politicians, the ministry or local MLA uh, about these dilutions is very, very important. Um, and like, you know, like I said earlier, the devil is in the detail. And, um, and therefore, a, a lot of the petitions that were out there um, against the EIA notification of 2020 um, seemed to me like angry rants that said, how could you put this out in the lockdown? You knew people could not protest. Um, or, you know, like, what are you doing? It's just one month to give you feedback on this. This is crazy. But not going into details as to how this this proposed notification is diluting the law um, is not something that the MOEF is bound to consider. Um, if, if you give them specific pointers um, that, that are substantial in their content and explain why this notification is problematic, uh, they are likely to, to actually pay attention to this. Um, also, I think I was talking to a friend who works with the politician and um, what he said was that they don't open emails that are basically bulk. Right? If you're spammed, you won't open those emails. So, so often signing petitions is not as effective as actually going to your inbox, hitting that compose bus button and writing an email out um, to people in power. Um, so that's, that I think is more impactful. Um, finally, I think um, we, we all, you know, there is this assumption that I'm a computer engineer or like a software engineer and I, how can I contribute to this? Um, or I'm a graphic designer, but I think everybody has a role to play and there is a variety of skill sets that are needed um, to put up a fight against, against such dilution. So, so I think um, just writing to the right people, um, putting your skills out there uh, and Donating some time and your skills to, to such efforts, I think, can go a long way. Uh, and of course, if you're extremely motivated and you have the resource and you've tried to engage with the government and have not got a favorable response, taking to court is always, um, always an option. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that was not too technical. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Mudula, for the other session. Hi. Uh, so, of course, question by Gaurav. Uh, others, I would suggest please raise your hand so there is no uh, understanding who wants to ask the next question. The question, Mudula, that Gaurav has for you is can people still go to courts to get a stay on a project after EI clearance? What is the process? Granting a stay order, I understand it will depend on cases, but generalized. Is there any percentage? Okay, um, so I'd like to answer this in two parts. Um, so, firstly, yes, people can go to court. It is the National Green Tribunal that has uh, jurisdiction over um, the EIA not the EPA, the Environment Protection Act, and therefore over the Environment Impact Assessment notification. Um, although, as I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if the audience knows, but um, the NGT has become a toothless tiger, right? It's functioning with 
abysmally low um, uh, low number of members, uh, judicial members that hear cases. Um, and and so over time, since since 2017, um, in where when there were five benches functioning, there are now two benches functioning. And this is one of the things I, I talk I mean when I say there has been a, a dilution. Uh, and and therefore, Gaurav, I think that often um, it's hard to get the NGT to, NGT to even hear your matter. Uh, the probability of granting a stay order in terms of percentage, I don't know, but based on my experience, um, I think a well strategized case um, with with solid research stands a good good chance to get a stay order. Um, this and I, I suspect again I only speak based on uh, what I what I've been observing at the NGT, but the number of cases in which stays have been granted has gone down significantly since when um, since you know since when it was functioning in its full capacity. Um, I see a couple more questions. Has ruling of NGT been made compulsory to follow? Um, so this is a tricky one. So the, the NGT is a tribunal. It is not a constitutional court, right? So it does not have, in, in a sense, it does not have powers of contempt. Um, and, and so I think um, it, it is, well, so to speak, compulsory to follow, but it is often not implemented. Um, sure, I'll, I'll be happy to share my email ID. Uh, what are the positives in the draft? Um, so that's a great question. I think, um, to be fully honest, personally, I see none. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, but I do see none. Um, having said that, though, I think it's also important important to mention that an overhaul in the EIA regime is not only an opportunity, um, you know, to like this, this phase is where we gave lots of feedback is not only an opportunity to say, hey, this is a problem and this is a problem and this is a problem. It's also an opportunity to say, can you make this better? Um, and, and so this, I think, is a great time to pick on, pick on that and say, here are some things you didn't change in the EIA notification since of 2006, but they needed improvement. So can you fix that? I'll give you an example of what could improve. Um, whenever a, a lift irrigation scheme is challenged in a, in the before the NGT, um, these these lift irrigation schemes are actually um, projects that get away in in a court of law on the ground that they are drinking water scheme, and a lift irrigation scheme has been inadequately defined by the EIA notification. This was a great opportunity to clarify that, but it has not been done. So when we do, when we write to the, I, I mean, I understand of course that the deadline for comments to the MOF is, is gone, but these are opportunities to not only say, hey, you need to fix this, but there are also opportunities to say, make this better. I hope that answered it. So Mudula, I have one question for you. Uh, yeah. so re like you pointed out earlier, a, a, a lot of youth are coming forward and asking questions about the EIA. Uh, but it is very generic, where they're just criticizing it like you're saying. Uh, yeah. You suggested that there are other ways to, to show your uh, disagreement or to show the contempt towards it. But the moment you say legal, uh, a lot of people get scared, right? How can the younger people who are not uh, old enough to back their own case still participate without being actively involved in the court cases? Because right now all we see is them sharing posts on Instagram. Most of them share it because their friends are sharing it. And some of them are reading about it. But how can the youth, especially the college people here, actively be involved in a process like this? Yeah. Um, so I think the first step is awareness and going beyond a generic, this is not a good draft and understanding the nitty gritties of it. There's some great resources out there um, to, to understand 
the finer details of why some of these uh, notifications or new laws are problematic. Um, now, so I think firstly understanding that and then talking about it more is very important. Um, I also think that, you know, it is not as, of course, going to court is, can be quite intimidating. I fully understand that. But I think also it's very important uh, to engage with the government during the, the, the phase during which they take public comments which is exactly what we have done so beautifully with the with the 2020 draft. Um, and, and so I think that keeping track of what notifications are coming out, understanding what they mean, and then writing back and engaging with authorities and letting them know that we are not, you know, that we're paying attention. It's not like we're just a, a country of people who, um, don't pay attention to what what's happening out there uh, is very important and also i think um, it is amazing to see the involvement of students and the youth right from the i think from the time the caa and those protests were um, i think a, some sort of starting point for students involvement in in these protests and to keep that steam going i think is very very important um, so, so I hope that helps, but I, I don't think there is a substitute to awareness, uh, because everything we do starts with that. Uh, I have a, uh, we, so whenever we talk about EIS, it is usually people assume that it has to do with some industry always. So there are, mm -hmm. it, EI technically is something that can be util, uh, utilized for assessing encroachment issues in urban landscapes as well, right? Let's say the team. Mm -hmm. So because yeah. uh, that a lot of encroachment is happening in urban landscape, which why uh, forested patches called as reserve forest or wastelands or grasslands or scrublands, right? That is something that the younger people, especially uh, that we are from Pune, explore around. Mm -hmm. And they see these changes. They don't know whether these can be pointed out or not. So how can uh, such cases be uh, flagged? and how what can people support it right um it's a great question because it doesn't take a lawyer to tell you this um and, and I, I think often that it is people who have knowledge of these projects uh, that can tell whether it fits within the ambit of the eia notification or not so i think all this takes is opening up this notification going to the schedule looking at um you know let me actually give you an example just a second i'm going to pull up the notification i think this is a valuable exercise um just a second sorry i only have the terrible 2020 draft before me right now so i'm going to just use that um all right so here you see, uh, so for let's assume that there is a cement plant coming up um, next to your house or, you know, um, in, in a grassland in Pune. Um, here, there are numbers here, which says that if it is under 1 million per ton animal, annum production capacity, it's a category A project. If it's if it's this, it's a category B project. If it's this, it's a category B2 project. Simply opening this up, looking at these numbers and seeing whether the cement plant that you're dealing with fits the bill is your answer to whether or not it is within the ambit of the EIA notification. It's really as simple as that. Um, so I think spending some time familiarizing yourself with, uh, with this, that just one that you know that one table um, that tells you which projects need uh, clearance and which don't um, is is it should I think usually help with determining these things. But I think it's also very important to remember at the same time, Sushil, that uh, the EIA is one tool, right? Um, so we we have an immense number of laws that can help with situations like this. Um, so, so of course, it's important to look at the EIA notification. It's also important to understand 
whether if this land you're talking about is notified forest, if it's notified forest, then there is a whole different clearance it requires. Um, or does it need permissions from the state pollution control board? Um, these are all legal grounds for challenge. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I, it's just the years of conditioning and like working with the law that I say it's not as complicated as it sounds. But I, I think it's, um, it's fairly straightforward to just open that table and understand whether or not it needs a particular type of clear. Uh, thank you, Vidla. Uh, in case anybody has any more questions, please feel free to write in the comment section or the chat box. Okay, I think with law, we are done with the questions here. Uh, I would cool. really like to thank you for uh, doing this because this is such a trending topic, but not a lot of people know exactly what this is and what it en encompasses. I also thank everyone for participating in this. I, uh, I hope you all like the session. Uh, we will be doing a few more sessions every week. Uh, we will be announcing them soon. In case somebody who missed uh, the beginning of the session, uh, we would be uploading this session on our YouTube channel. It is called Journeys Explore. So you can always catch up on the session there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mithila. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. And I hope that this was simple um, and straightforward. And, and I do hope that you take action. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank, thank you, you so much for organizing this. Thank you. Bye.